I can't believe anybody is here to listen to a lecture from a sociologist talking about rebuilding civil society. <laughs> what, what a completely unlikely thing this is for us to be discussing tonight. I'm like, I'm a little shamefaced to be here because I've been like madly tweeting all day my deep emotional response to this whole situation. By the way, tonight I'm going to be just referring to everything that's going on as the situation, um, which I think is a very healthy thing to do because part of the invitation of tonight's um, conversation is to help us think about a way of dealing with the thing that we're all in together and really to start to think about what comes next. So it's not that I also don't recognize that the house is on fire. I, I, I'm totally there with you. I feel that the house is on fire. And honestly, I have no idea what any of you think about the situation. Um, it it, it kind of doesn't matter, right? Because almost no matter how you look at it, it seems like the, the house is on fire, right? I mean, it's just, it, it's very hard to figure out what we're gonna do. So this is a little bit of a weird conversation because I wanna talk to you about like, how should we rebuild the kitchen, basically? You know, and it might feel a little weird because you're like Professor Kleinenberg, the house is on fire. <laughs> you, you might be missing out of it, I'm not missing this fact. But, here, but here's the reason I wanna do this. After today, it's not gonna get better right away. Like the next couple days are gonna be really hard too because no one has any idea right now what's gonna happen after today, right? If you're watching on this video, like 20 years from now, today was the day that the Kavanaugh hearings happened, okay? And nobody knows what's gonna happen tomorrow or, or the day after. But at some point, and I think before too long, we're gonna to have to figure out not just what's wrong with us, but also what we wanna do next, what we want to build, how we're going to rebuild. And if we can't do that, then I don't really think we have much of a chance at all. But I think we can. So that's what I wanna to talk to you about tonight. All right, so that's just a little prelude. The way I wanna get into this um, is to bring you back very briefly to the city where I grew up, Chicago. That's where I met Corinna. And that's where my first book is set. Any, here, any of you here from Chicago or spent time in Chicago? Excellent, nice to see you, go Cubs. We're almost there. Um, that's Chicago. Um, it gets hot in the summer in Chicago, but this is a, 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 a story that I'm gonna tell you about a week when the temperature hit 126 degrees, the, the, the um, heat index, like what it, what it feels like to a person. The actual temperature is 106, but with the humidity it felt like 126. And what happened is that um, cities are heat islands and they don't cool down as much as the areas outside of cities. And what we all do when it gets unbelievably hot and the weather's extreme, whether it's Los Angeles or Chicago, is we jam on the air conditioner, right? Like it was 100 degrees here today and I came to campus like, get me to an air conditioned room as soon as possible. And unfortunately, we now live in a society where the thing that we can rely on is that when we need our infrastructure to work the most, it's most likely to fail, right? And so that happened in Chicago. Hundreds of thousands of households lost power, some for a couple of days. Actually, so many people were opening fire hydrants to try to keep cool that uh, neighborhoods went without water pressure. You know, if you, if you lose power, you can't pump water up into high-rise buildings. So if you have a society organized around cities and the power goes out, um, it's a real problem. Um, and the transit system failed because tra train lines, uh, you know, will melt a little bit, right? And so the trains have to either slow down or they can't run. And the plates on bridges will expand. Um, and you sometimes get the traffic lights go out. And so you get into gridlock when it is unbelievably hot. And everybody in the city was talking about what was manifestly the problem, which is that the infrastructure broke. But it wasn't just the infrastructure for power and water 
and transit that was broken. There, was, uh, there were other kinds of infrastructures too, including the infrastructures that fundamentally shape how it is that we interact with one another and, prov and care for one another. Okay, and what I'm showing you now is a map of the neighborhoods in Chicago that had the most mortality, the, the greatest vulnerability during this disaster. And, and the Chicago people in the house will tell you that what's going on here is like the areas in the red are on the south side and the west sides of the city. And those are the traditional African-American neighborhoods in Chicago that are very segregated, for the most part very poor, have high levels of vulnerability. And so, you know, like in the next couple of days, they're gonna to start to release the Nobel Prizes. They're gonna be announcing, you know, who wins the Nobel Prize. I am never gonna get a Nobel Prize for this map right here. This is the most predictable thing in the sciences that when there's a big disaster, poor and vulnerable people are gonna suffer the most, right? That's, that's politically a very important thing to know, right? And you might ask, well, why is it that we don't just protect those neighborhoods? Great question. But that's not a scientific question, right? Science is, is what we expect. But it turns out, actually, what I got interested in is not this kind of simple fact about the the, the pattern we expect, but that when you looked more closely at the neighborhoods in Chicago, some fascinating patterns emerged. One of them, and the one I really keyed into in my book, is that if you compared neighborhoods that looked really similar demographically, places that on paper should have had just about the same outcomes, what you found, in fact, was incredible variation. So some of the neighborhoods in those segregated south and west sides were, in fact, incredibly vulnerable and had high death rates. But other neighborhoods that looked like they were gonna have high death rates turned out to be the safest places to be, even safer than many of the affluent neighborhoods. That was fascinating and scientifically very interesting. So what I did is obviously the numbers alone weren't explaining what was going on. And I said, what I've gotta do is go into these neighborhoods and try to observe the differences. And what I found is there were a set of neighborhoods like this one, this neighborhood's called Englewood on the south side. And it wasn't just very poor, it wasn't just segregated, but also it was depleted. It had lots of empty lots and abandoned homes. You know, the, the landscape looks a lot like this. Very little commercial density, not a lot of you know, very active religious organizations, civic organizations that had resources to help people out there. Um, sidewalks broken, the parks were a little bit overrun. And it turns out that if you lived in Englewood, you were massively at risk during the heat wave. Okay, this is one of the most deadly places you could be. This is a very poor neighborhood called Auburn Gresham, demographically almost identical. It's just across the street from Englewood, but the death rate there was 10 times lower. And if you spend time on the streets, you get a, a little bit of a sense for why. The sidewalks are intact. It's got pretty thick population density. There's a lot of little shops, you know, diners, coffee shops, barber shops, bars, restaurants, little banks, churches, neighborhood libraries, nonprofits. The street is intact. The, 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 the social system in Auburn Gresham is intact. And that meant not only did Auburn Gresham be, become a safe place during this heat wave, and what's, the, what's going on here? Why does that happen? Because if you're a person who's at risk, if you're old, if you're frail, if you're vulnerable, and you live in a place like this, you're more likely to have spent time outside in those public areas, getting to know your neighbors. The neighbors know if you're vulnerable that they should come and knock on your door. Or maybe you don't feel very good, you're uncomfortable at home, you don't have air conditioning, and so instead of just hunkering down at home, you go outside and someone sees that you're in trouble and gives you some kind of assistance, right? So if you live in a neighborhood like that, you get that. If you live in a neighborhood that looks like that, those are conditions that make you not want to go out of your house, right? There's not a lot of local action. You might be healthy and, and social in some ways, but you probably have to get in a car or be driven somewhere and go to another area because that's a fairly treacherous environment. I'm gonna talk more about this. And so it turns out that living here doesn't only make you safer in the heat wave. The people who live in this neighborhood have a five year longer life expectancy than the people who live across the street. And that's not a story, a simple story about whether the infrastructure for power works or the, power, or the infrastructure for water or for transit or for communications, that's a story about what I've come to call the social infrastructure. Now that's a concept that you probably haven't heard before uh, unless you're a macroeconomist in which you're wondering why I'm using it in this way because you use it in a totally different way and I'm sorry, 
there'll be more economists speaking another night. But tonight, <laughs> the sociologists are in the house. So, um, so social infrastructure refers to the physical places and the organizations that shape our interactions. And it's just as real as those other infrastructures I mentioned before. And what's important to know is that when the social infrastructure is robust, when we invest in it, it makes it more likely, that, like as in Auburn Gresham, that people are going to go out into public areas, interact with each other. Those interactions, at minimum, are decent and pleasant. But if they recur because you go to the same kinds of places, like there's one diner or a playground or a neighborhood library, then you build something more like an association. Sometimes that becomes a friendship. You know, aggregate them enough and you start to get something that feels like cohesion or even community. Yeah? That's when social infrastructure works well. When the social infrastructure is degraded or neglected, that's when people start to hunker down and get atomized, right? Wind up on their own. That's when things start to fall apart. Okay, so it's a, it's a real thing we need to be paying attention to. Now, I was writing this book about Chicago, and soon after I wrote the book, I moved to New York City. I, I'm guessing you've been to New York City, or at a minimum, you, you heard of Hurricane Sandy, right? You remember, remember Sandy when it hit New York City? Um, that was like the equivalent of the heat wave in Chicago, except that heat waves are silent and invisible, and so we don't really pay much attention to them, whereas hurricanes are awesome for television. <coughs> That's the sad news, like because they make for spectacular imagery, right? You guys are in Los Angeles, you get that. Heat waves are not photogenic. Heat waves actually kill more Americans than all the other natural disasters combined in a typical year. But you wouldn't know that because it makes for really bad TV. But Sandy was a crazy event because it had this you know, amazing storm surge, more than 14 feet. Um, it was a 500 year storm. But as we are now learning, like 500 year storms keep coming every few years. And so it tells us something about that category. But, so that's an amazing image because nobody on Earth ever thought that the power could go out in the financial capital of the universe for six days, right? And so I was there downtown. I was in the, the dark area. Um, and that happened in October of 2012. And it turns out that right before this event happened, I had taken over an institute at NYU called the Institute for Public Knowledge. And I said, the focus of this institute is going to be cities and climate change. We're going to try to use this institute to think about how cities are going to deal with the weather that's coming. The, the next month, Sandy hit. So I immediately got to work. I organized all these graduate students and faculty. We started doing projects all over the city. I started writing lots of articles, being very active. And I got this call out of the blue from a member of the Obama administration who said, look, um, Congress has just passed a $50 billion bill to uh, rebuild the region that was affected by Sandy. There was a very bitter fight around that, but the funding went through. And we're going to set aside some money, maybe a couple billion dollars, to, um, to, to generate some really innovative infrastructure ideas for um, making this region better prepared for the threats that are going to come in the 21st century. And we're going to call this thing Rebuild by Design. We're going to invite these architects and engineers and landscape architects from all over the world to compete. And we would like you to be the research director. Now, as it happened, you heard in the introduction, I, had, I wrote a book a few years ago with a comedian, Aziz Ansari. And just a few months before this happened, I agreed to write this book with Aziz. And I had no time at all. But this was a really important thing. And after all, it was you know, the presidential administration saying, you know, we want you to do this. So the only answer in that situation is, yes, of course I can do that. And so off I went. And my job was to be, as research director was to take the participants of the 10 final teams that made it through the early rounds and came to, uh, to, to develop projects. And they didn't have proposals. They didn't have specific design proposals when they came in. They just had teams and concept statements. And they all had experience. And these were like the best design teams in the world. I mean, household names and architecture and the biggest engineering firms. Lots of Dutch engineers because it's their export industry you know, dealing with water. And, and my job was to, to show them around the region. And 
I impressed upon them this idea that there's a thing called social infrastructure and that when you make plans to protect New York City from the ravages of climate change, make sure that you're not just building a simple plan, you're also kind of building in social infrastructure because this is an opportunity to, to, you know, to make life better all the time. And so I was taking some teams around and at first, you know, some people had this idea, oh, what cities like New York need is a wall, a giant seawall, you know, to keep the water out. Probably some of you haven't been to New York in a while. I just want to reassure you that this seawall here does not exist. It's, it's, it, that was just an idea that some teams had, right? Like, let's build a wall, okay? <laughs> but it turns out that's a really bad idea for water as well as for people, right? And building a wall just doesn't work all that well. There's a bunch of reasons why, but you can't put a wall around every part of the United States that is vulnerable to sea level rise and storm surge, right? You just can't do it. And, and you know, you might want to wall off certain areas that are really densely populated and have a lot of people and a lot of expensive infrastructure. But even if you were going to do something, if you, if you have a giant wall that looks like that, you, you start to turn the city into a, a, a fortified, you know, militarized war zone. Think about what we've done after September 11th. You know, I don't know what it's like in Los Angeles, but in New York, there's these bollards everywhere, these giant pieces of concrete and barriers, and there's security cameras and checkpoints. And you used to be able to go into a building, and you walked in, you'd go to the elevator, and you'd go up to the floor you wanted. Now, every time you go into a building, is it like this in LA too? You got to have an identity card. You know, you talk to the person that they, they scan it in, they do something in the computer. God knows what they're doing. They're probably on Google just checking something out. And they give you your back your car. There's like this whole drama that we go through, which is like the, the drama of security. And I don't know if that's made us any safer from terrorism, but it's certainly made life a lot less pleasant every day, right? And climate change represents a possibility for actually making life much better, right? Because we're going to rebuild infrastructure. And so we've got this catastrophic, you know, looming threat. And, and odds are we're not going to live up to it. I mean, it could wipe out a whole bunch. But it, could, it also gives us occasion to rebuild the infrastructures that we depend on. And so what I said to the teams is you've got to build social infrastructure into your projects as well. You can't build a wall like this. So there are ideas like this is a team uh, called SCAPE from a a landscape architect named Kate Orff, who actually became last year the first landscape architect to win a MacArthur Genius Award. And this is a design for Staten Island um, called Living Breakwaters, where she wants to change the way the coast works and build in a more natural kind of infrastructure um, and also cr remake the coastal area as a, as a place, a physical place where people will come together in shared activities, including educational activities that will reorient our relationship to to the water and to the ecosystem, right? Because I know this is true in Los Angeles. Like, we are, we, we've, we've gotten so modern and awesome with our technology and our cars and our fast, you know, efficient you know, ways of getting around that we've, we've kind of lost some of our relationship with the elements, right? You can live in Los Angeles and not really think about the very fragile ecosystem that surrounds us. And suddenly there's a huge fire, and it's like, whoa, why did that happen? You know? And, and so Kate's trying to think about this. So this is a plan from a Danish architect named Bjarke Engels uh, uh, called, that was first called the Big U because it was going to be a, a protective system that wrapped around lower Manhattan. It, 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 the federal government funded the Lower East Side part of it, um, which they call the Lower East Side Coastal Resiliency Project now. And, and this is functional. So also the Lower East Side does not look like this yet. But the design, which has gotten more you know, federal and state money than any other project in this competition, says, what happens if you blow up the idea of a wall? Right? So instead of building a giant wall around Manhattan, this is a, a sloped, they call it a bridging berm. It's a park. It's a playground. It's a running path. You know, it's a walking path. It's a bike path. It's, it, it functions like a seawall, but it makes life better all the time. Right? And, and those are the kinds of things like, I don't know, has, if you've ever been out of the country, you know, especially if you've been to like, you know, Japan or Singapore or Korea or many parts of Europe or even like some parts of South America, you know, you come back to the United States and you're like, oh my God, we're supposed to be this affluent country. Like we, our systems are falling apart. Maybe you don't feel this quite as much in Los Angeles, but come to my city, New York City sometime. I invite you to visit our airports. 
you know? Come try our subways. It's really, it's, it's not good in there, people. It's not, it's not nice. So, so, so there's one day when I'm taking this great team around and we're talking about how to protect people all the time while also protecting them from disasters. And I got this team and they say to me, Eric, we've got an amazing idea. We've really been listening to you on the social infrastructure business. We're gonna build a thing called the Resilience Center. And we're gonna put it in this very vulnerable neighborhood in Connecticut. And we're, it's gonna be a prototype. And then we're gonna roll it out because we think it's really gonna work well. And we're gonna try to put them in neighborhoods all across the country. I said, that sounds amazing. Tell me about this Resilience Center. And they say, okay, here's what it's gonna be like. We're gonna have this building that's gonna be kind of embedded in a neighborhood. And it's gonna be open as much as possible, maybe five, six, even seven days a week. It's gonna open kind of early in the morning. It's, we'll keep it up as late as we can. And it's going to, it's going to just be aggressively welcoming to everybody, <laughs> you know? The doors are open. And we're gonna have programming for people of all ages. So like if you're a young person, you'll come there and you'll get like some basic education. You know, you'll come with your caretaker, whether it's a parent or a grandparent or a nanny. Or, like, they'll want to come and there'll be kind of family activities and people socialize with each other. Um, if you're an older person and you're looking for some companionship, you know, there'll be a place where you can come together. And, oh, by the way, we're going to have, we're definitely going to have all this technology there. We'll have computers and we'll have Wi-Fi access. And you could just go there and, you, you know, you can kind of plug into the world. We'll do some programming. And they're describing this place to me this like magical, futuristic resilience center. And some of you are laughing. And I was kind of laughing too on the inside, but I'm a professor, so I don't get to laugh, you know, in that way. But I said, you know, that's an amazing idea. Great work. By the way, maybe we should go check out some libraries. <laughs> and so we did. And, and so, you know, it occurred to me as they're describing this magical resilience center that actually you know, like we have that technology, you know? We have some pretty good ideas for how to do a library uh, and, and a resilience center at the same time. And this is a library in the Lower East Side, not too far from where I live, called Seward Park. It's a Andrew Carnegie building. And some of you, but probably not all of you know that Andrew Carnegie, who was like the Mark Zuckerberg of his time, um, you know, the wealthiest man in the world probably at that time during the Great Gilded Age, um, kind of a jerk, uh, very violent towards his workers, you know, hired Pinkertons to come and break up strikes, you know, pretty damn ruthless when it came to treating laborers, but also an immigrant um, who believed that what was special about the United States was that it offered opportunities for people who didn't have them at home and opportunities to make something of themselves and saw in the library a place that could uh, raise one's spirits and, and raise one's station in life as well. So he, he funded construction of more than 1,700 libraries in the United States, more than 2,800 libraries around the world. And they, they were often like this, you know, grand buildings with big windows and high, high ceilings and places where you could go and sit on your own in private and have access to books and um, where there was programming and librarians who would help you out. and there was a whole idea about a library as a place where you could go to escape the tenements and the factories and the hard things in life and make something better of yourself. And so this idea, right, that a library is a place where you walk in and the staff says to you, you know, how can I help you? And then they say this other thing, which you don't find anywhere else where you go in, which is, can I give you something for free that you really want? That's a crazy idea, right? Um, so I go to this place and I start showing these teams, like, you know, let's think about the library. And the team's like, yeah, yeah, library, whatever. I want to build a resilience center. <laughs> but I persisted. Um, so I, I got fascinated by this idea of the library. And, and the libraries, you know, they're important and they exist in, in, in places all over the country, but there's some neighborhoods where they are especially important. And the Lower East Side, is famously uh, an immigrant neighborhood and a poor neighborhood. It remains those things today. Um, but it is also, like so many American neighborhoods, a gentrifying neighborhood, right? And so there are a lot of people who have lived in the Lower East Side and spent time there who were always at home there who now feel like they don't, just don't belong in the same way. And 
you know, you can see the signs of it. Like this guy is going to sell you a $7 ice cream cone, you know? And that's like kind of cool if you are thinking about a $4,000 studio apartment, you know, you want to make sure like I'm not going to buy a $4,000, rent a $4,000 studio apartment unless I can get a $7 ice cream cone nearby. It's not going to be a satisfying gentrification experience <laughs> if I do that. But, but for a lot of people that tells you like, oh, this neighborhood's not for you anymore, right? And that's a real issue in places like Los Angeles and New York. And it's not like the, those ice cream shops are the only places in town. There are places like McDonald's and Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts. But may, I don't know if you guys notice this when you go into those kinds of establishments, but they often have signs like this, right, that say, you know, you, you, you could come here if you spend your money and get the hell out pretty fast, <laughs> you know? Now, if that's not true for all of you guys, right? Like, if you're a white person, you can stay as long as you want, right? That's kind of the story. And we kind of, like, I don't know, it's uncomfortable to say that, but we all watched it. You guys see what happened in Philadelphia? I know some people are like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened in Philadelphia. There are so many people who are like, of course that happened in Philadelphia. <laughs> that happens all the time in so many places, in so many cities, right? Like, you go in, you sit, you wait for your friend. I've done that many times. I have never been arrested for waiting for my friend to show up. But we learned something about like race and belonging and inequality and, it, and, and public spaces work that way. And, and it's not just on the Lower East Side. There was a group of Korean Americans in the, in, the, in the borough of Queens a couple years ago who would regularly assemble in a McDonald's. They would buy breakfast and sit together and at some point the manager was like, I don't want these people here for that long and just kicked them out. And it caused a scandal because they were like, no, we're staying here. And there was a fight about it. And the court of public opinion uh, said McDonald's was in the wrong. But the thing is that even the kind of third spaces, like the famous places where you go and eat and form community in a commercial area, it's nice you know, to have a good coffee shops and restaurants and things like that in your neighborhood. Don't get me wrong. But you have to spend something, right? You have to have something. A lot of the places in this neighborhood now, you actually you, you can't even have cash. You can only buy things with a credit card. Do you have those places here? That you, you like hand the money, like, no, sorry, we don't take money here. <laughs> um, the library is a totally different kind of place. The library is a place that signals to you from the moment you can see it that you're welcome to come in. It, it has become the paradigmatic example for me of what a social infrastructure can be. And you see this thing every morning. There's this assembly of people of all different types, you know, for all, come from all different backgrounds who show up at the library and sit outside waiting for the doors to open. And it's this amazing scene. I'm just going to take you through a day in the life of the library. I actually published last week in Slate um, with a wonderful photographer named Joey O'Loughlin this photo essay of a day in the life of Seward Park. You know, so I'm going to go through a bunch of her images just so you can see what happens, like, you know, the kids waiting outside to come in. And the kids are there, by the way, because Elementary schools in New York City right now, the public schools, they don't have enough money for libraries anymore. So if the kids want to do a research project, the, the teachers have to go to the library. You know? And this girl has just gotten her first library card. And there's this you know, world of young people who come with their, their parents. Generally, it's a mother or some other kind of caretaker. And I don't know what you guys are like. Again, I haven't met you before. But I bet there's a bunch of you in this room who can kind of close your eyes and think about the library that you used to go to as a little kid. And I bet you have some pretty powerful memories of like, that place. And the library card is, for many of us, like the first time that we're afforded the respect due to a human being who's independent, right? Like, you get your first library card, and it's like, oh, man, I, I could, you know, that's me. That's my name on the library card, right? And it's my library card. It's not yours. And I can take the things that I want for myself, even though I don't have money. I mean, it's a very powerful experience. And this girl is pretty fired up. You know, this is a big day for her. And we happen to be there, and the mother's pretty proud too. You know? And it's a nice moment. And for a lot of kids, it's like the library is a really key place. You get introduced to literacy and to all different kinds of cultures. And for a lot of kids who are from families that can't afford to just buy books, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's where you bring the books home. It's also a place in a diverse neighborhood like the Lower East Side where kids from different communities who might not otherwise spend time with each other they start to establish some bonds. The Chinese American kids and the African American kids and the white kids and the Latino kids, they all go to the same little reading classes. And they do it in three languages. And it's pretty cool to see. 
and the caretakers get to know each other as well because like it's a, it, I don't know if any of you ever had kids in here, but at first it's kind of an amazing thing. You know, you, you have a kid and like your life has changed and then like some, a lot of families, like one person goes back to work and typically it's the dad and then the mom is like home with the daughter or the son and then suddenly it's like, oh my God, everybody's gone and I'm here and it can get very lonely and hard and a lot of people get freaked out and a little sad and a little lonely. And so it turns out libraries are these amazing places if you're a new parent where you can go and you meet other parents who are in your situation and all these relationships develop. And caretakers, like maybe some of you have worked as nannies or babysitters, like the library is an amazing place to go. You meet other people. And it still is a place where immigrants come and they study you know, English as a second language and they study citizenship classes and young people go to get some time and some peace to study by themselves. Um, my uh, father and stepmother lived not too far from here in Pasadena for a while. And you know, I used to sometimes go to their local library and like at three o'clock when the school ended, ended that's weird. <laughs> I was, yeah, I promise that was not me. <laughs> uh, at three o'clock, like it just, everyone would rush into the library and the kids would come in and this whole scene develops just like a, a safe place where kids can go and be off the streets and do their homework or hang out and, and play video games and, and get counseling. I mean, it's kind of a great thing. Do art projects, right? Because schools don't really have art budgets uh, in a lot of places. And it can be a little overwhelming, you know, for the librarians because sometimes it's just too many people. I, I have no idea what that sound is, but there's something funny going on. Um, this is a great scene. This is not at Seward Park Library. I just want to take you into this um, basement in a library in uh, East New York in Brooklyn, another very, very poor neighborhood. Um, and once a week, they have a program there called the Library Lanes uh, Bowling League. And there's not a bowling alley in the basement of this library, but what they do have is an Xbox. And every week, uh, Library Lanes bowling teams from around Brooklyn uh, meet at the same time and they engage in virtual bowling competitions. <laughs> and I am like a sports fanatic, okay? You probably caught that Cubs reference earlier in the talk. And I go to sports events, I, I take my, my, my son is a soccer player, I love to go to his soccer games. And I have, I've, I, I'm, you're not gonna believe me, but I will tell you that watching the sports event, which the New Lots team won, by the way, was just about the most fun I've ever had because, um, I'll get back to that in a second. I mean, this is the, you know, to get the ball. If you've ever played like Xbox bowling, you have to put your hand. <laughs> Someone is really messing with me here tonight, guys. Maybe it's my phone. I'm going to put my phone here and see what that is. Maybe it's going to get better now. Um, anyway, um, the thing that was so amazing about it is, is look, at, look at the faces of these people. And what's incredible is that this is a group of older people, many of whom live alone, who have every reason to wind up like the people in Chicago who were isolated and whose isolation cost them so much in the heat wave. But instead of being isolated, here they are bowling on a Thursday morning. And just take a moment and look at the faces that you see because like, those faces don't just happen spontaneously. There's a context, there's a place that produces a face like that, an experience, a social experience. And the social infrastructure is what makes that possible. That's why a library can be such a special place. And I was so taken by it. And I put this image up because like 25 years ago or 20 years ago, a great uh, political scientist at Harvard wrote this book called Bowling Alone. And the bowling alone is like the saddest idea in the history of our species, right? It's, it's like, because bowling on, itself, on its own is, is kind of sad, but bowling alone <laughs> is like a whole new level of sad. But no, I actually like to bowl. But, but, um, but it just captured it as a metaphor the spirit of, right, this is a sad thing. And it was a, the metaphor was for the collapse of civil society. Instead of bowling together in groups, we're, we're bowling by ourselves. But that is not bowling alone, right? I mean, that is the opposite. And the place where you find it is the library. And it's not an accident. But the problem is, because like when we think of what's an infrastructure that really matters, you know, what are things we really need to protect and invest in, we tend to think about things like the electrical grid, the bridge, the airport, right? That infrastructure, that's what that means. And so libraries in this country and around the world are being shut down. Branch libraries are being closed. The budgets are kind of up to the last minute all the time. It's like if the city council happens to appreciate it, not in all cities because there's some places that fund them well, but they're always imperiled. 
And then sometimes the city will build like a bright shining library kind of in the center. So like everybody wants to give a lot of money to the New York Public Library and 42nd Street because they want to put their name up on there, you know? And if you've been to Seattle, you know like Rem Koolhaas designed an awesome museum right downtown. And Austin, Texas has this incredible new museum and our, our library. And the Los Angeles has an amazing library. But the problem is these branch libraries, which are really like the heart and soul of our neighborhoods get neglected time after time. And it's not just here. I'm, in, in England, the, this kind of push for austerity um, is leading to library closures all over, and people are pushing back against it. So it's become a fight you know, to get this basic, elementary, good thing. And it's important that we not lose this thing, because Im imagine for a second that the library did not exist. You know, imagine that we did not have the concept of a library. And someone came up to you and they're like, hey, I got this great idea. Let's build these really great buildings in neighborhoods all over the country. Let's build, build tons of them. And what we're going to do is we're going like, to get all these books. Let's get some DVDs and CDs and things like that, too. I don't, do they make CDs anymore? There's probably people in this room who are like, what is he talking about, a CD? That's such a weird concept. Um, you get all these cultural things. And you get computers, and you're like, OK, the thing, here's what we're going to do in this building. We're going to just give them away for free. People can let, borrow them, and they'll bring them back. And that's what we're going to do. Oh, that's amazing. Do you have to like, pay money to this? No, you don't have to pay. Do you have to be a member? No. Well, you have to be a citizen. No, you do not have to be a citizen. Everybody, by virtue of their humanity, can do it. Can you imagine that idea coming out of this culture in this moment right now? Could you imagine us inventing that idea? And in fact, like, no surprise, over the summer, an economist writing an article in Forbes magazine said, let's get rid of these things. The library is obsolete. Let's knock them down. They're not worth the public investment. Show me the cost-benefit analysis that really cashes out the library as a concept. Let's just take them down and put up Amazon stores, because we all know everybody loves Amazon. I'm a book writer. We're going to try to sell you books after the talk tonight. I'm not, against, I'm not against Amazon, but come on, right? Are you kidding me? And people said that. I mean, so many people said, are you kidding me, but in a much more clever way on Twitter. <laughs> you know, like the librarians of the world united. Uh, and, and, and it was overwhelming. And Forbes took the article down. You cannot find the article anymore. They took the thing down. <laughs> that was a horrible transition to this slide. I'm, I'm like at the beginning, the book just came out, so I'm trying to get my talk together. That, this is not representative of my feelings about that article. This is how <laughs> I need like a segue slide in here. I don't have one. So, but, but the idea here was that um, we spoke out. I mean, people turn out to really love their libraries, but it's not really clear that people who um, are running the show, like the people who are running big companies and the people who are running the, the government. It's not clear that everybody appreciates how valuable libraries are. Like here's an area where that kind of 1% and the rest of us distinction makes a difference because you do talk to people who are incredibly affluent, incredibly powerful, very, very privileged, and they're much more likely to tell you, yeah, like nobody uses the library anymore. We just all use Apple. You know, I'll just get my kids an iPad and they can download all the books they want. And it is striking how out of touch so many people who are powerful have become. Right? They want palaces, but not for the people. That was Andrew Carnegie's concept, by the way, palaces for the people. That's how, what he called them. Now, why do I have this gun there? I have the gun there because the book is not just about libraries, even though I do love libraries, and they're the paradigmatic example. The book is an argument that social infrastructure, the places that we build, shape our interactions, shape our quality of life, can help us solve a whole range of, can help us address a whole range of problems if we build them right. And you know, I'll leave you with you know, one other story, which comes from the city of Philadelphia, uh, which is one of the cities that has a really serious gun crime problem in this country. It's a place where the gun crime has been a little more persistent than others. Chicago's like that. Uh, Baltimore is like that. Detroit is like that. And those cities have something in common. And what they have in common is this. You probably remember this image from Englewood. This, look, remember the Englewood, the neighborhood that had all those deaths from the beginning? This is not Chicago. This is not Englewood. This is Philadelphia. But there's almost 50,000 uh, empty lots and abandoned buildings in Philadelphia. 
And people who live around them have always thought, you know, these things are worse than just ugly. They also increase the danger of living in this neighborhood because criminals like things like this. Like if you're dealing drugs or, or you're going to, you know, you're going to do something kind of untoward, this is not a bad thing to have around you because if you get in trouble, you can kind of dump the thing. You know, you can dump your stuff in the grass and if there's an abandoned house nearby, you can kind of hide out in there too, right? Nobody wants to go into those abandoned houses. And so this team of researchers from University of Pennsylvania, led by an epidemiologist named Charles Brannis, who's now in Columbia, teamed up with the city of Philadelphia and the Pennsylvania Horticultural Society, which sounds like a gardening club, but is actually like a great civic institution. And they said, let's run an experiment. We got these 50,000 empty lots. Let's spend a few hundred bucks per property and let's randomly select a bunch of places that we're gonna treat. And the treatment's gonna be, we will fix up a lot. So that's the same lot. It doesn't cost a lot of money to do that. Put in a little uh, post fence, pull that debris and the weeds out, you, know, you prune the tree a little bit, and now you have a kind of a little pocket park. It's not Central Park, you know? But it's a lot better than that, right? And they want to see like, what happens. You know, let's compare what happens around those lots with the, what happens around the places that we don't treat. Here's what happens. By fixing up the empty lot, especially if there's an abandoned building there, boarding up the abandoned building, these guys have been able to get and sustain over a decade a 39% reduction in gun crime. Right? That's a crazy number. And the more incredible thing is it's not like the gun crime just moves to the next block. Right? The gun crime goes away. And the reason for that is that even though we think of crime as being about the characteristics of the criminals, right? it's about like the tendencies of criminals, that's partly true. But crime is also about situations. Right? There's some situations that are really good for committing crime. And there are other situations that suck for committing crime. You know what I mean? Like, that's one of the reasons that like, people like to live in New York City right now, because there's so many people on the street in the busy areas. And there's, so much, there's so, all those stores, the social infrastructure is so robust that we look out for each other. Right? And that's why we don't want to be in a dark alley. But if you live like here, you're living around a dark alley all the time. Right? You've got a dark alley on your block all the time. And as it happens, it's not just that living in a place like this means you're more likely to have a gun crime. You're also likely to know that, and so you feel that in your bones, right? You feel that beneath your skin. And think about times when you've walked through a neighborhood that feels uncomfortable to you. If you walk by a place like this, these guys hooked up residents to heart rate monitors. If you walk by a place that looks like this, your heart rate spikes. Science students here, why is your heart rate spike? What are you feeling? You're feeling stress, right? And one thing we know about living in a very poor neighborhood is that you tend to have higher levels of stress-related disorders. Yeah? You seen this? That, remember when I told you that Auburn Gresham had five-year longer life expectancy? That's not because of the heat wave. That's probably because of these stress-related disorders. So it turns out, like, if you live around this, when you walk by this, your heart rate doesn't change at all. Why would it? There's a famous article called Broken Windows that's like the Bible of the criminal justice movement. And Broken Windows has this whole story, you know, like you, you have a neighborhood that's in trouble, windows get broken, a house gets abandoned, windows are broken, graffiti goes up, and then this whole cycle of disorder comes in. And our response to Broken Windows has been, we gotta really pay attention to those neighborhoods, and if anybody does anything out of order, let's arrest them as fast as possible. In fact, let's just go to places and we'll stop and frisk people. You know, just because they look like the kinds of people who might cause trouble. That's what Broken Windows has been. So here's what I propose in my book. Fix the damn windows. <laughs> what happens if you, if you deal with the abandoned houses by boarding them up? It turns out this is what happens. You get a better world. You spend less money. You send fewer people to jail. You improve the quality of life. You reduce crime. Can you imagine? What would have happened had we reacted to that theory that way? It would be a very different country right now. California would be a very different state. I, I lived here a lot from the, in the 1990s and 2000s. I lived through the mass incarceration in California. It changed this state. 
there are neighborhoods that will never look the same because of mass incarceration. All right, last couple of minutes and we're done. Tonight's not the night to do this, okay? We're not gonna start this project tonight, but at some point it's inevitable. We have to spend money on infrastructure because the systems that we have don't work anymore. I, I, I'm betting everybody will agree with me in this room. Like, there's two things I think we all agree on no matter what our perspective is. The first is infrastructure is broken. Second is society is broken, right? And if you don't believe it at the end of today, bless you. <laughs> So we have ideas about how to fix the situation, right? Remember the situation? We're still in it. It's been a very lovely hour that we've spent together. But we have to leave this room, and the situation persists. So one idea is, like, build a wall. But a wall is anti-social infrastructure, right? A wall can only harden our divisions. It only turns us against one another. It only separates us. It does everything that we don't need any more of. It's a horrible idea, and it's a very dumb piece of infrastructure. Whether it, you're trying to keep out people or water, it doesn't work. There's another idea, and that is that like all this stuff you're talking about, Kleinenberg, that's like yesterday's stuff. You know, the library is obsolete. You know, nobody hangs out on the corner anymore. The new social infrastructure is in your pocket right now. Right? Every one of you has got a social infrastructure in your pocket. It's your phone. You've got Facebook. You've got Instagram. You've got Snapchat. You've got Twitter. I'm sure you've got stuff that I've never even heard of. <laughs> and Mark Zuckerberg told us all after the 2016 election. He wrote this big letter to the 2 billion subscribers or users of Facebook. I'm one of them. And he said, you know, we are going to be your social infrastructure. I think that would be a horrible thing. And actually, he knows that that's not a good social infrastructure. It's a communications technology. It works best when it gets us to meet each other face to face. And the reason I know he understands the value of social infrastructure is because I spent time on the Facebook campus. Anybody ever been to one of these tech campuses like Facebook or Apple or Mountain View? Let me tell you, the social infrastructure rocks. It's paradise there. They have spent so much money with the world's best architects and designers to build these incredible places, like everyone's got private office and shared space and uh, like a private meeting room if you need that. And you can have like the kombucha bar and free yoga classes and a soccer field. And like every, it's amazing there. It's amazing. They built the best social infrastructure money could buy. And uh, you guys remember the Google bus? You guys know about the Google buses, these big buses? In theory, it's a great thing to have a Google bus. I took, it, I took it down, I guess. Google bus, like, we've got all these employees and they want to live in San Francisco and we're, we're going to get them to, uh, to Mountain View and they don't have to take their own private cars. But so then what they do is they get a private transportation infrastructure, these big fancy buses, and then they put them on the roads that they share with everybody else, the public infrastructure, and it's like the buses fly by the rest of us and they pick up all the young people for the express purpose of allowing them to live in gentrifying neighborhoods where they can buy $7 ice cream. Like that's the whole point of the thing. And it's just, a, it's just feels terrible, right? That's why people in San Francisco are so angry about it. Like if you live in San Francisco, what you understand about the Google social infrastructure is it involves sucking the fumes from a bus that's making the highways even more crowded. And Zuckerberg knows that, he's a smart guy. There's another way we can do this. This is Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is a, a, play, a brand new playground called The Gathering Place. The money comes from the philanthropic sector, not out of keeping with American history, right? You heard the story about Carnegie. But I don't think the philanthropic sector is going to save us from this, guys. I'm sorry, but the billionaires, you know, they mainly want to make sure that the billionaires are going to be OK. And they'll throw off some things. And, you know, and I appreciate the, the good things that, that their greatest philanthropists do. But this is going to have to be more of a public project that comes from politics and comes from the government, because there's no other part of society that has the resources to do this. So that's who's going to fund you know, the big infrastructure projects that are going to keep us safe when the next hurricane hits. That's who's going to take care of our libraries so that people who live alone and in tough neighborhoods can have a smile like this. Right? Next time someone asks you about infrastructure, next time Infrastructure Week rolls around, <laughs> tell them we need uh, Social Infrastructure Week, too. All right, thank you very much.
All right. So, so we have some time for questions. Um, there's, there's books in the back, and I want to go too long. I can, I can um, sign books, and we can talk about um, things one-on-one -on -one there, too. But let's take some questions together, too. I have a microphone. I can come to you if you've got a question. Did you figure out what that sound is? It was the station downstairs. Oh, really? Hi, hey, guys, it wasn't me. I just want to be clear about that. Those weird sounds were not me. Yeah. Hi. So I love sociology, and I love urbanism. So you're talking. Fantastic. Talk, merge those. Yeah, they're perfect. come to the right place. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, like I think the Claremont Colleges have um, pretty good social infrastructure. And part the of the, the what does? The Claremont College is here. The Claremont College um, is, thank you. And yeah. part of the reason I think for that is just the fact that we have a smaller scale. Um, and w with smaller communities, there's more chances for chance social encounters and things like yeah. that. Um, whereas when I've spent time, um, even in some places like you mentioned, New York and LA, um, just because they're so big, um, that can present some obstacles. So I'm wondering in this sort of paradigm you're proposing, um, how do you deal with the question of scale? Yeah, that's a great question. So there's actually a chapter in the book that's about education. One of the chapters in the book is about college campuses and school campuses generally. And one of the experiments I talk about there is the small schools experiment, which involves going into places that have enormous schools. Uh, New York City has a lot of these places and breaking them up a little bit. So when you have a five-story building that has 2,000 students, you know, what happens if you make it five separate schools with 400 students each? You know, not charter schools where it's like we're changing control, but just like have the public system run the schools differently. And it turns out, like, there's some controversy about how effective this is. Um, but my read of the data is that it actually works pretty darn well. Like, you get pretty amazing results if you can take a school from 2,000 people where no one really understands who's controlling what and who's in charge and break it down so people have, uh, you know, more personal relationships with one another. That said, what happens, I think, in cities is that we, like, I live in New York City, but I don't live in all of New York City. We all make these small little worlds inside the big places we live, right? And that's a kind of fundamental lesson of urban sociology, too. Like, the classic studies in the history of urban sociology are studies of neighborhoods or of small places. And we have, a, we have a, uh, an art, we have, a, as, as human beings, to find those you know, sets of um, places that work better for us, of finding at the right scale. Um, personally, I would have found it very hard to be an undergraduate at New York University, because it's such a big school. Don't tell anybody I said that, because they pay my paycheck. And a lot of people, like, they want to go to NYU because that's the scene they want. But I kind of like, I have a taste for, you know, being 18 to 22 years old and, like, living on a college campus that's like this, right? It works for me. Um, but I think that even when we're in large-scale settings, we find a way of, of winnowing things down. I will tell you one thing, though. I grew up in a little a neighborhood in Chicago, which had a fairly high level of population density, but not a massive one. We had a lot of single-family houses mixed in with apartment buildings. And it was a, it was, Chicago's like a stoop culture kind of place. Does that, you, does that concept mean anything to you guys? I don't know if there's stoops in Los Angeles, but it's like you ski outside and you sit on the stoop, and you hang out, and you walk by your neighbors. Now I live in Manhattan you know, kind of near Union Square in Chelsea, and we're so damn busy all the time, and there's no, you don't sit on the stoop because, like, cars are going by and there's crazy shit happening everywhere. It's like, so you just, nobody sits there. Brooklyn is a little bit more of a stoop culture, but Manhattan is not. And I think, you know, what happens in Manhattan is you need to have a third place, whether it's a library or a diner or a coffee shop or something like that. But great question. Yes, right there. Wait for the microphone, I think, right? Yes, please. Thank you so much for your um, presentation. I was wondering in your um, research of libraries if you found like a trend of securitization just because I went to my um, childhood library recently and there was a new private security guard and it sort of startled me. Yeah, so here's the thing about libraries. Remember I told you that like the teachers bring their kids to the library because that's where the books are. There's no libraries in the schools anymore, right? And I also told you older people go to libraries because oh, maybe the senior centers are a little bit boring or libraries are just great places to you know, have some an interesting cultural life. So it's older people go there. And teenagers go there because we tell the teenagers, like, you don't want to be on the streets. Like, be responsible and do your homework. And you can use the, you play the video games there if you need to play video games. But also, if you're an opioid addict, and you go to get your maintenance dose in the morning, what, they'll, what should I do? They say, oh, go to the library. 
You know, there's heat in the library. There's air conditioning in the library. There's clean bathrooms in the library. There's a computer in the library. I said, great, I'll go to the library. And if you have a mental problem, with, like a mental illness condition, and, you're, and you need treatment, and you're kind of too unstable to work, and you ask your counselor, like, where should I go? They'll be like, oh, go to the library. They have all these amazing programs. Yeah? And if you're homeless, and you're in a shelter, they clear you out of the shelters at 8 o'clock in the morning or 9 o'clock in the morning at the latest. And you're like, I don't have any place to go. And they say, don't worry, you can go to the library. And so the reason that there's securitization in your library is because we ask everything from our libraries now. The libraries have become places where all of our problems get funneled. And you know, I wrote this op-ed in the New York Times a few weeks ago. And I got it was this amazing experience because I got, I, when you're a writer, basically the one rule of writing is never read the comments. You know, it's like the only thing. First you have to write, and then you have to not read the comments. And all these people are calling me up like, Eric, you've got to read the comments. The comments are amazing. I got hundreds of comments that were so enthusiastic, and like my Twitter blew up with all these people who were telling me these amazing stories about the library that they wanted to know. And the only thing that I got that was negative is some librarians were like, I feel like you're celebrating the fact that libraries do all this stuff. You need to understand, Eric, that we are overwhelmed by all these problems that we have to deal with. It's too much. And I'm sympathetic to that. And the reason that a lot of libraries have security guards now, so first of all, it's interesting that libraries do not have police officers, right? And that is different, because you would think, when I told you about all the different kinds of people who come into that place, that actually you would need to have police officers. Security guards are a little more benign, benevolent, than police officers most of the time. I don't know what your police officers are like here, but you know, police officers, you know, they have a tool and they know how to use it. So, so, um, so it's kind of an ama amazing thing that we don't need police officers in libraries. And I will tell you that in the time I spent in libraries, I saw some really ugly, hard things happen. And I saw some unruly people and I saw people in trouble and I saw people be aggressive and I, there were some scary moments. But in retrospect, what's amazing is how few and far between those moments were. Like actually how civilly we behave when we're in the library. How the institution, the setting, the staff, it's designed to bring out the best in us. And for the most part, we comply with that. You know, we live up to our, those expectations for ourselves. And so that's why you have security in your library. But notice also all the amazing ways that we manage to get along there. OK, there's a hand here. So this is kind of a related uh, issue. OK. Um, but um, in speaking about social infrastructure, a lot of this kind of context takes place in public spaces. So how do you address surveillance and inequalities and how that's applied to like race and yeah. ways that we can rethink that because it's often used as a context for increased safety, uh, security, et cetera. Yeah, so the, to be honest, in the book, I don't really take up the surveillance problem all that much, although I think it is an issue and I think you've named the issue, which is that I talked a little bit about it in terms of broken windows and there's a big section in the book that deals with that and that's just a, a more a concrete form of surveillance. Surveillance is applied pretty in, in, unequally, right? And some people are surveilled more than others. But probably if you live in Los Angeles or New York or Chicago, or most places these days, you're surveilled a hell of a lot anyway. I mean, there are cameras everywhere, right, tracking us. And I guess the one thing I want to say is the argument in my book is not like, oh, we just need to build more libraries and more playgrounds and board up empty buildings and everything is going to be fine, right? The, I'm not that naive. The, the argument is more like we need to build places where we can gather and they could, they could go one of any ways once we get them up. Um, it matters, matters not only that we build them, but we also have to maintain them. It, they work better if we program them, right? Libraries are programmed. Um, they work better if we kind of default to decency in the way that we treat the people who use them rather than towards punitiveness. Um, and we can easily mess them up. So in the book, I write about a couple examples of public spaces that we've built that we messed up really badly. Take, for, for example, the swimming pool, the public swimming pool. You would be hard pressed to find, like, 
I started the book, I was, everyone was like, oh, you gotta go to Iceland, because in Iceland they have these swimming pools and they're the center of civic life and they're these amazing places of integration and there's great conversations. Like, yeah, actually the swimming pools in Iceland are amazing things. Let's look at the history of swimming pools in the United States. The history of the swimming pool of the United States is so ugly, you know, it's shameful. It's a history of brutal racial segregation, you know? Like, and, and, and like big fights over whether people of color could use swimming pools that white people used. And cases that, I write about stories in the book, like a famous African American uh, performing artist, movie star, puts her foot in a swimming pool in Las Vegas and they drain it, right? Or like a city refuses to integrate its swimming pool and the court says you have to integrate it and they say fine, it's closed. And desegregation of swimming pools happens and then Americans start getting their own private swimming pools in their backyards. So it's not the best story, you know, the swimming pool. But we know how to do it better. And, and there are some places that have done it much better. Chicago, my city, it's a brutally segregated city. I mean, it's awful the way Chicago is set up. But I was there visiting my family a few weeks ago and I went to this new park called Millennium Park. It was a gorgeous Saturday afternoon. And there's a big band shelter and there's like a smaller space. And they had like a dance, like a series of dance performances. And I walked into this park and there were people from all over the city who were together. And there were these dance troupes that were multiracial, multiethnic. And it was just, you know, that you ever have those moments where you're walking in the city and you're like, you just come upon some beautiful thing. And you're like, oh God, I've been reading about the situation all day. I've been feeling so bad about the situation, and now I found this thing, and it's, it was great, you know? Like this, is, this is, like, this is what it's all about. I have that feeling when I walk into a library often, but I had that feeling walking into this place in Chicago. So you can do it, we can do it better. Just because we screwed up the swimming pools, doesn't, we, we should remember that, but we could also do it better. Okay, I think we got one more, one last yeah, question. Final question. Yeah. Hi, thanks again for your talk. I just had a quick question about whether you either in your experience or in the future, think that development projects that focus on sustainability and resilience, like building that into communities, could themselves be sort of a magnet for, say, green gentrification or displacing vulnerable communities out of where they've lived for generations because people with more money are more interested in living in those spaces. Yeah. Not only do I want a $7 ice cream cone and a $6 cup of coffee, I also want sustainable architecture and a green space and a bike path. That's what you're saying. Well, that's a great insight. It's totally a problem. And it's a really serious one. And so there's a chapter in the book that's about climate change and building social infrastructure to deal with the climate threat. And this is a great passion of mine. You know, and it's something that I really worked on hard in this Rebuild by Design competition. And you nailed the potential downside of it, which is like, that image of um, the Lower East Side that I showed you, which is a very poor area, and now you build this bridging berm, and suddenly you've got this new park and a bike path, and it's already getting gentrified down there. And suddenly it's like, ooh, wow, this is great, you know? I'll pay $4,500 for a studio apartment there now. And so we were working on, in this competition with the uh, neighborhood organizations about how to do this, because they understand that they need the neighborhood to be improved, that you know, they, they want these amenities, and they also, know that they need climate security. They, they, you know, they can't get flooded over and over again. And from the very beginning, the risk was like, how, can you build this here and guarantee us that we're not gonna get displaced? Right, the, the buzzword in, in, in the kind of climate world now is resilience. And resilience means like you can bounce back. And it's pretty clear that you cannot bounce back if you're getting bounced out. There's no doubt about that. And so, it turns out in the Lower East Side of New York, you know, one nice thing about the public housing is that it's very hard to gentrify public housing. It's not a lot of public housing projects get turned over to the private market. But there will continue to be gentrification there. And in, if you build social infrastructure and you build green infrastructure and you don't also work on housing policy, you're gonna have green gentrification. It's going to be a problem. And so again, like the same point I just made, we have to build these things, we have no choice, but then we have to treat them right, right? The social infrastructure is just the first step. It's a necessary step, but it's never gonna be enough. Okay. 
guys, I, this is much, this is a better night than I thought I was going to have. Like, you know, a couple hours ago, I was like, I can't believe we're all going to die very soon. <laughs> and now, you know, I don't know how you feel. I feel a little bit better just uh, being here with you. So thank you. Uh, it was really nice. Thanks.